Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very have a special very guest special for you today. Talking to Dr. Marlon and Dr. Sander about his career in the ring. Please, please, put your hands together for the man, the legend, the legend. Braveheart himself, Mr. Anish Josh! How you doing guys? Welcome to the iMedics Coffee Shop Podcast. Um, today we have a very special guest here in the form of a professional boxer called Anis Taj, as nicknamed Braveheart, and uh, he is from Watford. His professional record so far is three fights, zero losses, and two knockouts. But before we get into that, we have Dr. Mo here and Dr. Sandy here, who are the co-founders of iMedics. And uh, we'd like to introduce you. So, Dr. Mo, you want to go first? Absolutely. So, first of all, welcome, Anis. Thank you for joining us, of course. My name is Dr. Mo. I'm a UK doctor. I've been a doctor now for 10 years in the National Health Service. And I specialise in family medicine, so I'm a GP by uh, speciality. I'm also the co-founder of iMedic, so we educate about 12,000 doctors each and every year. Those, those are UK doctors. And iMedic was co-founded in 2017, so a very brief introduction to myself. So Vikas, what, if you want to introduce yourself, perhaps. Right, so again, welcome, and it's great to have you on this um, iMedics podcast today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Sandhu. Um, I'm the co-founder of iMedics, uh, which, as Mo has touched on, is an um, online medical education platform. Uh, we help kids get onto medical school with virtual work experience, lots of free webinars, um, as well as kind of um, exam revision resources for medical students, junior doctors, um, GP trainees, hospital doctors, and also international doctors who are looking to work in the UK. Uh, do a bit of charity work as well. We're looking to expand into the humanitarian aid division. Um, worked as a GP in Greece and in Bangladesh for some of the refugees as a volunteer, and we're looking to utilise our database of doctors um, in the coming years so that we can help populations in need. Uh, I'm also a GP, so it's a family doctor. So I've been a doctor for about um, nine, nine and a half years and a GP for about three and a half years. Uh, and of course, we're still practicing as well. Um, and I'm also part of the NHS England Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, uh, which is quite useful for kind of business connections and mentoring and things. Uh, so Abs, perhaps a, a nice introduction about yourself as well. Just remember that the listeners are going to be thinking, who's this guy? So um, my name is Abs. I work for iMedics. I deal with the email marketing side of things and the social media marketing side of things as well. And I also work um, alongside the ambassadors as well. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, of Pakistani origin, uh, born and raised in Coventry. So I'm local with the company. And uh, yeah, so I've got an IT background. I studied IT in college and I've done a few marketing um, side projects here and there. And uh, yeah, I found iMedics and I've been working for them now for about a month and a half, coming up to two months now. And uh, yeah, so that's a brief introduction about myself. So without further ado, let's introduce Braveheart and East Taj. How are you doing, man? You okay? How are we doing, guys? Thanks for having me. Um, as so for everyone, you know, everyone is watching as well. Anis, my name is Anis Taj. Uh, my nickname is Braveheart. I'm of mixed heritage, mixed Pakistani and Scottish heritage. My mother is um, Scottish. My father is second generation Pakistani from uh, the Azad Jammu and Kashmir region of Pakistan. Um, professional boxer now. I've had three fights, three wins, two by way of knockout. Um, as an amateur, I was 2017. Uh, national champion for the Alliance England Boxing Association, um, 2017 England Challenge Belt winner. Uh, I've represented England three times. Uh, 2019 number two ranked Pakistani amateur boxer. Um, along with that, I was part of the Pakistani National Olympic squad, and I was ranked yeah ranked number two out there. So then I decided to turn pro, and at the moment three and zero. Going for four and zero on August the seventh. The date is, and uh, inshallah, God willing, we'll be going for world titles. That's the plan. 
Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, we were very excited to have you here, so thank you for coming down. Um, so let's just uh, quickly move on to how you started. So what was your inspiration kind of when you started, you know, amateur boxing or even just training? So start, you know, boxing has always been something that we have been involved in as a family. We've watched it. Um, you know, I remember watching Tyson Lewis. I watched Gappy Ward. So it's, it's stuff of the Muhammad Ali fights from back in the days. Countless videos, the older uh, videotapes. You've got so many of them on the VHS that I, I just sit and watch at times. So it was something that I've always been involved in, but I, I've always been a sports person as well. So originally I was a rugby player as well as a footballer. Um, then eventually got into boxing a bit more, a bit more, until about 15 years old when I went down to um, a gym in St Albans just before my 16th birthday. Started out there and um, I haven't looked back. So perfect. Now, obviously, um, I have to put this in there that me and you are cousins. And, um, you know, obviously, we've known each other. Unfortunately. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... I remember the days when you were doing rugby and when I met you a few times and you were slightly on the larger side than you are now. So uh, talk us through kind of that journey of you losing that weight and how you went around doing it, your mental capacity to be able to keep it up. Um, yeah, over to you. Uh, all right. So when we say on the larger side, I wasn't too heavy, but I was chubby to a degree. Quite a bit. Um but as a rugby player, you don't, you're always going to be fit. You, but the the whole point is you don't have to be light. Um, so there's never been an issue in having to diet when I was a rugby player. Even as a footballer, I was quite, you know, sturdy li little tank in, in, in essence. And that's what, you know, was required of myself. Um, but when it got into boxing, the the whole aim of it is to be as light as possible because the heavier you are, the bigger people that you're going to fight. And that's something that myself, um, I've fallen foul of that a number of times because as I grew with age, um, I got bigger. Um, so, you know, growing height, growing size. But originally I was, I think, in there was a picture that was taken that I'm sure Abs may have this inserted into the uh, the video. Um, so this picture was taken in 2010. So this was about a, a year and a half before I actually started uh, training boxing. At the time, I was I was fit for what I needed to be doing, but when it got to boxing, I knew I had to lose the weight. So just along with my training as um, down my boxing club it would be going on, on my runs and there would be times where you think about it you're out on the run you, you know you're getting the miles in and it used to be just two and a half three miles but when you're not used to running that sort of distance three to four times a week each week um, and you're just getting into it. it. It plays on the mental side because you start thinking to yourself, is it worth it? Why am I doing it? You know, do I need to do it? And there was times when on the run you start feeling a little bit weak, you know, you're getting gassed a little bit. And then that's when it, it, it all starts getting in. It's, it's a mental side of it. So it's how do I keep myself? I'm, I'm not going to stop with myself. It's If someone challenges me to do something, even if I challenge myself, I'm going to finish said challenge. So be, there'll be times where I'm running and it's me reminding myself as to why I'm running. I want to be a boxer. It's for, you know, I want to be the best that I can be. So it would be, it would be like a bit like in, in a movie where, where the, the, you know, the main person is, is having a, like, a little argument with themselves in their head just to make them do something. And that, that's, that's how, how it would be. And that's how I lost, I lost the weight, by, by getting out and doing it, but also, you know, listening and fighting myself. You know, the, the urge that we have to, you know, oh, just be comfortable. But t to end up losing weight, you need to get out of a comfort zone. You need to be put into essentially like a deer in the headlights. You need to be put on the spot. You need to be at the forefront. You can't be comfortable in your life.
needs to be taken out of that zone. I guess a lot of people kind of do that when they're put on the spotlight and, you know, when it gets hard for them, they tend to give up, you know. And one thing with you is you kept your self-motivation up and you kept on trying to get to where you are now. And I think people need to understand that if they want to get somewhere and be successful with whatever they want to do, whether it's losing weight, whether it's just, you know, a small task, they have to stick at it. And um, I guess that moves me on to asking you if you have any advice for anybody listening, you know, they want to, you know, be successful in something. What, what kind of tips can you give them? The, the main tip is just trying your best. And the saying it's uh, the saying of if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. It's something that everyone says, but no one knows the true meaning. By that, it's not just something to, oh, you know, oh, you, you know people say it as, like, oh, don't worry, you know, first you don't succeed, try and try again. It's, the saying in boxing is, winners don't quit, and quitters never win. That comes into play. So whatever someone's doing, whether it's pass, trying to pass a driving test, whether it's trying to pass, you know, your, your, your medical test, whether it's, you know, trying to pass to get into medical school, trying to pass your A-levels, if you don't pass them at first, make sure you keep trying. But each time that you fail or each time that you don't succeed, you need to pick up where you went wrong and use that as your, you know, moving forward, uh, if I didn't revise hard enough for this test, next time, make sure I revise double hard, etc. So that, that, that's the sort of advice that I would give. Exactly. Thank you for that, though, and I hope people benefit from that advice. Um, now, obviously, you're a professional boxer. Now, you had three fights. You know, you haven't lost a single fight yet so far and two knockouts. So first we'll go on to your amateur career now. Your amateur record is 27 fights with nine losses. So kind of talk, is it not nine losses now? Take away some of my wins from me now, cousin. <laughs> Anise, we'll have a word with him later, don't worry. In the, in the, in the, in the back room. I think, I think you're going to have to cut my wages for that one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, as you said, so I guess there's another part that comes into motivation when you lose a fight. What goes through your head when you lose a fight? Um, so it's, it's the same. Um, everyone that I had lost to was significantly better than me. Um, as when I started, again, as we, we knew, we, we've, we've touched on that, I was a big lad. So um, having someone who's fit at 83, 84 kilos at 16 years old, there's few and far of them between. And the ones that are there, most of them are in the top level because those who you know, weren't good enough have stopped boxing. So very rarely you'd get you know, someone who would be like me, two fights, three fights, you know, uh, all wins, and you can't get someone who's had six and won six. So you've you've got to take that delve into the deep end, and myself, that this this is exactly my my third fight was against someone who'd had uh, six fights, six wins, and I was two wins, two fights, um, and it was a step up. I lost the fight on points, and it was something that as soon as I got out, I was annoyed at myself, not because I got beaten, but because I felt like. Had I prepared better, had I, um, you know, in the fight gone that extra distance, I might have won the fight. So from then on, dealing with the losses has always been sort of going back to the drawing board. And I always recorded my fights. So I'd watch a fight back, not once, not twice. You know, winning the fight or losing the fight, it would be about 10 to 15 times. And I would break down where I went wrong. And then I'd go back to the club. Normally, you know, you win a fight, you have a few days off. When I lost the fight, I wouldn't give myself a day off. I'd be back in the next day working on, even if it wasn't full training, I'd be there going through the motions on what I did wrong and trying to work to correct these errors. Anise, quick question. So, you know, what advice would you have for medics who fail exams? Because that's a very similar situation. Like, you go for a big fight or a big exam, you fail it. What advice would you have for, for medics and doctors? Um, 
With the medical exams, I'm unsure as to how they would work. Uh, I, I've got a law degree, and on my law degree, a few of my friends um, who failed an exam, they would receive their paper back. So what we we would do as a group, uh, of my group of friends, we would, whoever would fail, we'd tell them, request your paper, go through it, and then you, you get that copy. So then we'd go through where they were weaker. So same with, me with, with medical school. Even when you come out of a test, you, you have a feeling, you speak with your cohort and you're like, oh, are you put, like, for example, are you put, oh, 10, up, oh, I, I put 100, how did you get 10? Then you start questioning where you went wrong. And from that, you then use the areas where you feel you are weaker and try and strengthen those areas but also not neglecting the areas that you did well in originally because you may end up weakening those areas by the lack of revision in said tests. Thank you for that advice, though, still. And again, I hope they benefit from that advice. Um, so obviously, one thing I want to touch on is when you step into the ring, what does it feel like? I mean... As far as I'm concerned, my experience or talking to people that have stepped in the ring, they've all said that all your emotions come to you at once. So what's your experience, you know, you know, stepping in the ring? What do you feel like? Are you overwhelmed? Are you happy, excited? What's, what's your experience like? Um, for me, the, the emotions don't come to play when I'm getting in the ring. Um, as I said, I played rugby to a decent degree, played football to a good degree. So it's, I, I, I played in front of, you know, a certain amount of people. I, I, I'd known the atmosphere walking into, you know, it's like walking into the ring is like walking into a stadium, walking onto the football pitch. So I'd, I'd been through that before, but in for myself, where my first fight was, um, it was a very sort of busy. Uh, pub so it was crowded so walking through you have people and you're from the opposing club this is that that club the person you're fighting fights for the club that are holding the show so he's got all his supporters i've got about five or six people there there to shout in my name so when it's oh and he's targeting here a few people clapping you know, it's, it, some people find that, for example, you know, there's people at my club that felt overwhelmed, that froze. Uh, whereas for myself, it was more on the way in, a few hours beforehand, where you're looking around, you're trying to find out who looks like your opponent. So you, you're trying to gauge everyone in the, in, in the crowd of boxes that are weighing in until you go, oh, that guy looks my way. And it's like, oh, you start thinking, oh, he looks a bit better than me. Oh, he looks a bit stronger than me. But that was, my first fight was like that. As soon as I got in the ring, it was down to business. And after that, I kept it on a, a, on a sort of um, stage where trying not to let my emotions get the better of me. I'd rather have that the day before or two days before, I'd go through my mind what could happen in the fight. And then on the day... A bit like Mike Tyson said, you know, I start, I stopped. You know, people they would call my name. I wouldn't, I wouldn't acknowledge that my name was called. I wouldn't, you know, say hello to the fans or anything like that. It was just simple staring at the guy, not blinking at him. And uh, as soon as he blinks, that's it. I've got him. I've beaten him. Yeah. And if if I hadn't beaten him, it's it's that mental side of things. So it's like, are you going to be able to get deeper into it? If I go hard, are you going to be able to go as hard as me? So I guess is what they call uh, entering God mode when you enter that ring. You know, a lot of I know a lot of boxers that have said that either beast mode or, or God mode. It's basically you know you just you're focused. Now you know as soon as like Mike Tyson, you said as soon as he blinks, you know you've got into his head. And I guess that's your kind of style. You you're mixing like styles with Mike Tyson mental wise you know you got Muhammad Ali styles when you fight Roy Jones Jr so talk us through a little bit about those I know they're um, your inspirations you know you did you did touch on that before so talk us through a little bit more about that so um, if a boxer tells you he doesn't he doesn't have anything from another boxer past or present he's a liar that's just the, the long and short of it boxing is the art of imitation so each boxer has shades of a boxer from the past 
or boxer from the present in them. Myself, I've styled myself on Muhammad Ali um, as well as Roy Jones Jr. because of my, um, you know, Alhamdulillah, thanks to God, my um, ability, uh, my reflexes, sort of my natural ability, my God-given talent um, was, uh, you know, I've got good reflexes, I've got good hand speed, I've got good bit of power, you know, especially for my weight, I don't move like a cruiserweight or a heavyweight, I move like a middleweight. You know, I'm on my, on my toes. So I, I had to look at people who, before me, were like that. And for myself, it was the likes of Muhammad Ali, the likes of, you know, Roy Jones Jr., Sugar Ray Leonard, looking at these and studying the way that they, you know, come overcome their challenges in the ring and how they, they you know, what punches they've used. So, you know, it's every boxer takes bits of another boxer. And it's that's how they how they get the game. So for myself, I've got you know I do what Roy Jones used to do. So I'm Muhammad Ali, you know Sugar Ray Leonard, Evander Holyfield, Dwight Muhammad, Kawhi. There's a lot of them that I could name, and I could say I've studied this guy. Even Canelo, you know, it's silly that someone you know of my weight is doing something that Canelo might do, but it's stuff that you you see works, and you're like, if it can work for me, let's do it. And that, that that's pretty much what boxing is. It's the art of imitation. And that's imitation. what makes you, you different as well. You're incorporating stars from another weight class into yours. And that's what kind of your speciality is. So obviously, and, and obviously it's working, you know, so far, three fights, zero losses in your professional career, which is very good so far. And you'll, uh, we'll touch on your first fight, which was in late 2019, which actually ended by way of knockout in the first round, 48 seconds into it. So uh, kind of, I was a bit shocked myself when I seen it. Uh, watching the fight and then next minute you you've landed some crazy overhand right or something like that and he's just on the floor and he's out so talk us through a little bit about that uh well yeah with that fight um it was a risky fight my coach sort of advised against it because the guy was six foot nine um let's not you know make it out for what it is and he was a journeyman he was there to do a job um if but he was one of them that if he could win he would win as was, you know, he'd, he'd had losses, but he's also had won. And he'd knocked out a few people that I... Uh, he knocked out one guy that I had sparred with. And I knew uh, another Pakistani boy um, from down here in um, South... Uh, South... Yeah, Southwest. Uh, no, not Southwest. Uh, West London. Um, around sort of that... Well, not really. Slough, Reading area there. Just, just outside of West London. Um and the, the guy was, you know, my coach said it was a dangerous fight. He advised me against it. I thought, you know what, if I'm going to make a statement, no one else, plenty of other people are taking this guy in their fifth or their sixth fight, seventh fight, and, you know, stopped him in the third round, fourth round, fifth round. And I thought, well, it's, if I'm going to make a statement, let's make a, let's, let's just go out and do, do a statement like this. And, um, yeah, so I went with a, right hand to the body uh, to start out with. I noticed that he dropped his left hand as I did that. I didn't throw it to land the shot. I threw it to tease what he might do. So it's, it's, that's the, the ability of having having a, a good brain and especially a good boxing brain, um, noticing things as we're going along, just making my game plan, not making it up as I go along, but adjusting it as we go along. We knew that the overhand right would come into play at, at one point or another. I decided to tease this right hand. I saw him drop it, and I went, okay, I'll do it again. But instead of just going in and coming back out, I'll come straight back in with an overhand right. And, yeah, 48 seconds, that's all, all they wrote. He, he got dropped, and uh, as far as I'm aware, he's the only, um, I'm the only person who's knocked him out in the first round, in the first minute of the first round especially. I think a bit, I think Abs was gutted. He had his popcorn ready, sitting down for maybe twenty, thirty minutes, and everything ended after sixty seconds. Pop of tea, and the next thing you know, Anissa has got his hand up. <laughs> Anissa, I've got a quick question for you. Actually, just touching on this. So, um, what does it feel like on fight night? Because I know you just mentioned that sometimes you know there's hostile crowd, um, and also you touched on the way in. You know, like when you're looking, oh, I might be fighting this guy. Like, how did you feel? This is your first professional fight. The headgear's gone. Like, talk me through, talk me through the way in, and then how you felt in the dressing room like this is fight night Anise Taj you know first professional belt so 
Of for my debut, it was at York Hall, which is you know in in England is is known as you know sort of like Madison Square Square Garden is known as the mecca of boxing in America. Um, you know, as much as I dislike the phrase the mecca of, but it's something that's said. Um, and York Hall is the same in England; it's the home of boxing. So, on the way in, I knew who my guy was because. He was six foot nine. You, you couldn't miss the guy. You know, my, my, my father looked at me and he said to me, you had to pick him, didn't you? And my father's not a short guy either. He, he's a big guy. And he just looked at me and he goes, yeah, I don't think you're knocking him out. Because his, his face was looked as wide as anything. It's like someone that you could tell, you know, he's, had, he's taken a few hits. So that's when in my head I start thinking, with my, with my father saying this, my coaches were talking about this as well. So it's like, I'm trying to formulate a game plan in my head, as well as what me and my coaches have gone through and what we will be going through in the, in the changing room. It was, where, what do I see? Even whilst we're just weighing in, what can I see? What weakness can I see in his body? Where can I see a little effect? Can I see a little, for example, like talking about it, like medically, you know, injuries. Can I see a little touch on as happens with boxers? You know, you have you have injuries to the ribs. Can I see a little bump? So it's all about sort of becoming a bit like a doctor, where I'm sort of analysing my, my my opponent as if he was my patient, trying to see where I might see a little bit of vulnerability. Um, then when we got into you know the changing room, went and had a bit of lunch because the weighing was early morning, and then went and had a bit of lunch and just speaking about it and. The mind, my mind start, stops going from being nice, nice, you know, nice and nice, you know, the, the gentle, friendly giant, as some people call me, to being a hard-nosed so-and-so. Now it's, I'm, I'm no longer nice. My phone goes off, you know, no messages, aeroplane mode. I don't really want to talk to anyone. If they want to message me, all fair play. If they've come to watch, cool. I'm not going to talk to you beforehand. I'll talk to you after the fight. Um, and it just goes into headphones on. I've got my, my music playing, just getting into the zone. And then that walk in, ironically, for my first fight, my the music failed. So I walked into silence, no music, but people sort of cheering, jeering, you know, opponents of mine from the amateur days that have turned pro as well, sort of watching out for me. And it's just you've got the you've got the hood on hood over you. Of your of your robe, and it's just like you're walking into battle. It's like it feels like as if you're in a movie Gladiator. You're walking in to the Colosseum. You know it's about to go down. You know, not it's not as as bad as oh one of us is going to die, but you never know. You never know what may be real. I might get knocked out. He might get knocked out. But it's that walking in where it just feels like you know what this is what I'm destined to do. This is where I'm supposed to be. Just that feeling that I'm home. Embrace that moment that this is it. Because um, you said earlier on about the fight and flight, because a lot of us will be thinking, right, I'm going to the ring. This guy, you know, six foot nine or whatever, you know, however it'll be, he's going to come and knock my head off. So I need to be, and lots of people would panic at that stage. So I suppose um, it shows that you've got a very, and, and lots of professional sports, but you've got this strong mindset where you're like, no, I'm doing this. I'm here now. I'm gone through the ropes. I'll put the preparation in. You did touch on something, uh, Anise, which I wanted to ask you about, actually. So boxing and like injuries and stuff, obviously um, there's been famous cases in the past. There's been, I think, the Gerald McLennan one with Nigel Benn, wasn't it? Um, there was Michael Watson, um, yeah. again, in the Chris Eubank, those super middleweight days. Uh, there was a guy called, was it Adonis Stevenson? He was your weight, I think, cruiserweight. Yeah, no, 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 he was light heavyweight. Adonis Stevenson, this was recently where he was in a coma, uh, Chris Eubank, uh, I think Chris Eubank Jr. fought uh, recent. This is was, was an issue in regards to I think where we're touching on brain on the brain scan. I mean it was uh, Blackwall. If I, I, I can't remember the name specifically, but it was I think it was Luke Blackwall or something along those lines. Where um, you know he's, he's come out with it with a brain injury. That kind of, because I suppose you mentioned that you did football, you know, you can get injuries on the knees and stuff, and they can be bad. Rugby, you can get some nasty stuff, but boxing is kind of, like when you hear that, although it's not very common, and thank God it's not very common, but 
like how, how does that affect you does, does that kind of change does that make you train harder does that you know because it's not a it's quite a dangerous sport in that sense how do you get around that and you start what, what's your mindset when you when you know about these cases my mindset is god has a plan so whatever whatever may happen, it's something that's uh, within you know being a Muslim is in in religion we see that God has a plan for everyone. It's it's already written. So for example, it might be written that tomorrow I'm in a car accident. You know, God forbid, car accident and I can't box anymore. So then, what do I do? I use my law degree that I, I received a few years ago, and I go to work as you know a paralegal and within law. Um, and in boxing, it's the same that. I leave it to, you know, the Almighty. He's written everything. So if I am to get an injury of those cases, then, you know, it's part and parcel of the game. As as, as bad as it may sound and as sort of... Um, i trying to think of the, the correct term. Like, as, yeah, it's really as bad as it sounds and as... Um, you know, dated as it sounds, yeah, whatever happens, sort of a bit like Rocky, if he dies, Ivan Jarvis, if he dies, he dies. It's, it's, that, it's that situation. It, that's my, my mindset is on, I go in, into the ring, I do a dua, I, I pray for myself and my opponent um, that, you know, God gives the better man the victory. I don't ask specifically for myself, just give the better man the victory. Help me get for it. Give me the strength and the intelligence to get for it, etc. And keep him safe and me safe, and let us both go home safe. Because a lot of professional athletes have that mindset, don't they? they, they, they there's a lot of um, a, a connection between sport and religion. So when I, I suppose, I suppose you've answered it actually, which is how do I deal with the pressures? And actually, some of it is destiny you put down to you know God's plan, and also you pray which is, you know, protect me and, and, and obviously protect my opponent as well. But so I suppose that's a good protective mechanism because then you're you're taking that pressure away from yourself and you're like, look, I've put my trust in God and I'm going to give it my best. So that's interesting. Uh, I just want to touch on something while we're on that topic because you told us something interesting about the British Boxing Board of Control uh, and they do have a protocol because obviously, like you said, um, there has to be some kind of you know mechanism to support boxers and you said about mri heads and also the mra which is the kind of uh, the magnetic resonance but the angiogram angiography type where they look at the blood vessels and stuff just talk us through the kind of medical protocols that you go through uh so with professional boxing uh, when you're going for your license you first you have the interview so they check if you're actually um who you not just who you say you are but it's, Sort of like a job interview where they check your qualifications in effect. Have you been an amateur boxer? What have you won? For myself, it was pretty much um, in and out. Oh, yeah, you boxed right now. We, we know you. We know Brave. Yeah, we've, we've heard about you. You boxed in the Mexico team. Yeah, we, we, we've got that. You're, you're an international boxer. For some people, it's, oh, but you've not had more than, uh, you've not had more than 10 fights as an amateur. So then they ask, well, we, we might give you a license, but on the basis that you have a trial where we need to see if you're up to the standard of box of what a professional boxer should be. Uh, this is to save those who might have only had two or three fights go, going in and getting hurt, where, you know, a, a brain scan and a medical can only, uh, you know, prevent so much, whereas if you're putting in any old person to get in the ring, they could get hurt if they're going up against someone who is trained you know, properly as they should be. Um, so in, in the in the medical, you know, blood blood uh, we have blood tests for uh, you need you need to be clear of HIV, AIDS, um, so any any blood diseases, um, hepatitis as well. We get checked for, and we also have I believe it's the hepatitis B vaccine um, to box. So if you've not had it, you need you you have it done on your medical, um, and then each year they check your. Um, uh, I mean, they, they do the blood test to check to make sure that you, you're still at the sufficient level of, um, pro yeah, immunity and protection. Yeah, otherwise you have a booster. Um, and then in addition to that, so not only do you have to pass that, you have to then pass the uh, brain scan. So the British Boxing Board of Control have probably one of the most stringent uh, 
medicals in the world. Um, and it's known for that. A lot of people, wherever we, I've boxed in Serbia recently, they said the same. They said, you know, the British one is one of the most strictest uh, medicals that you could have. Um, but it's because of the history. In example, you know, for example, you've got Michael Watson, you know, with his injuries, you've got the, the, the most recent one with Chris Eubank and uh, Luke Blackwall, I think it was. Um, you know, and you just see boxing is a sport where you're taking blows to the head. Not just the body, you're taking it to the head. So there's going to be issues around your brain and if it's protected enough and if it, you know, you need to have preventative measures. So not only do we have the MRI, we have the MRA, which a lot of other countries don't do. So anyone from abroad who comes over, they may have had a bre uh, an MRI scan that's, you know, perfect, but they need to get the MRA done as well to make sure that they, they, can, they can ensure that there's no issues um, with, with anything to do with your brain um, and then if there is you don't have a brain assessment done by a brain specialist to make sure that if there is a and this is only like s slight changes over the years if there's something significant it, you don't get your license my coach my coach was um, uh, fell foul of that that exact rule because he um, failed his brain scan but it changed uh, to a certain degree where they said they wouldn't give him a license. And is this an annual or is this after each fight or is it? Have a um, MRI done to see if you have a concussion or if you have you know any any issues. Yeah. And hopefully you won't get stopped either. Hopefully you'll be the guy going on to bigger and better things. Will be um, the other question I wanted to ask you, and you should know the boxing doctors. So on fight night, you've got the doctors that come in. Now, obviously, when we watch it on telly, we see somebody gets knocked out. Doctor comes in. If it's really bad, they often give oxygen. But sometimes it's not that bad a knockout. You know, the guy recovers within a few seconds. They shine the pupils, a, a, a torch into the eye. Do they do a further assessment when you're back in the dressing room, like yeah. check the nerves and stuff? Or yeah, yeah. So they do. Um, so before you go out, you have to see the doctor as well. Same in the amateurs, but in the professionals, it's obviously a bit more stringent. Uh, well, okay, no, I'll say that it's, it's similar in the amateurs, but. Um, after the fight, they'll check you. So with my opponent um, in my first fight, you know, and my, my third fight, the, the doctor checks them in the ring. They, everyone will claim they're okay. The doctor will then take you back and do a few, um, a few, okay, yeah, sort of like tests just to see, you know, reactions, you know, if, if everything's all right with your brain. Because from what I spoke to one of the doctors, he said it, that there are some, some tests that we could do here you know, with reactions and, like, reflexes to a degree where we can see if there has been any further damage. So not just when they, they look at your pupils, if they dilate or if they stay dilated, you know, um, they, they, do, they do take you around and do a few more tests in the back of uh, once they've got you sitting down, sort of rested in the back room. So, yeah, so they, they do. And, you know, they've got, a, they've got a big duty of care towards, uh, towards professional athletes because they are there to help prevent as much as they can further injuries um, and it's you know all, all it takes is not having one check proper uh, one properly done check after uh, a fight and you know if he's if the guy's boxing a week later um, and he falls foul and you know such as you know Adonis Stevenson fell into a coma having issues like that where you, you may fall into a coma or you may have a blood clot, may, you know, you're swelling on the brain and stuff, issues like that. Yeah. Yeah, th th that's really interesting. And I suppose it's good to know that from a boxing fan point of view as well, that um, they have a system in place which not only, first it tries to prevent, so it's actually looking for the problem before it even starts. And then obviously post-fight detection so after you know someone's had a few shots to the head they've got a system so that's quite useful to know Anise and obviously I'm glad that I'm glad they've got that and it's good that they, they're strict with it as well um, I've got an interesting one obviously we're gonna so I've been looking at Anise's um, Instagram which we will add to our um, our platform it's the Anise Taj official one and I come across uh, so I can see that you were with Joe Joyce uh, so 
some people may not know who he is, but the boxing fans will know that Joe Joyce is a, uh, Joe Joyce rather is a former Olympian. Um, he's on the verge of a world title shot. He's very close to fighting Anthony Joshua. I think he beat Daniel Dubois recently, didn't he? Fractured his cheekbone. Um, so, and I can see that you're actually with him. You've been sparring and stuff. So, talk me through what that was like, because obviously you're at the beginning of your career, and he's kind of just on the fringe of world level. Like, how how did you find that? What kind of? And I've, I suppose there was so much to learn from that as well. Mm-hmm. Well, funny enough, I'll be there tonight. Uh, so I'll, I'll be back with him tonight. I think I've got tonight might be my last sparring session with him for in prep for his next fight because they'll be winding down. But um, yeah, so sparring Joe, it come about. Um, I was offered it, and you know, upon hearing that you've got myself, I normally stand at about 95, 96 kilos. So if we're talking stones, we're talking about 15, 15 and a bit stones. Um, when I'm out of out of fights, um, I sparred a uh, his management company is S Jam. So I sparred another one of their heavyweights in January when I was night I was about 97 kilos at the time, and you know gave him a good spar. And my style is one where I'm not going to go crazy with shots. I've got good head movement, especially when I'm at heavyweight. I fought a number of times super heavyweight in the amateurs um, at super heavyweight. So. I've been about, I know what it's like having fight, you know, fighting and sparring with the bigger lads. Um, When it came about, I'm a similar stature um, in terms of height, um, reach to a degree, uh, and just shots that I use to his upcoming opponent, Carlos Takam. So when it came about, I was like, you know what? Perfect. I would, you know, love to spar him. There there is that issue where at the moment I'm standing at 92 kilos because I've just come off a fight. And I went back into camp after a few weeks. Um, so I didn't really gain much weight. I caught COVID as well. So any weight gain that I might have had was negated from being ill. Um, and so I was standing at 92 kilos. So I thought if it gets a bit ridiculous, because he stands at about 19 stone, whereas I'm just just over 14 stone four. So it's five five stones almost of weight difference. So I was like, if it gets ridiculous and I start getting injured, there's no point in doing it because it's not going to change my life. You know, it's not like I'm getting paid a hundred grand to jump in the ring with him as a spa. Um, but it was brilliant sparring. Um, he is, you know, a gentleman inside the ring, outside the ring. He's got that mean streak about him, and I could tell why he's called the Juggernaut. You know, he he's got a chin and a half. I threw everything at him and I threw the kitchen sink at him and probably the the bathroom toilet as well and the bath, everything. And he just he caught him with one peach of a shot and he just, boom, heads turned, looked back at me. Then I thought, oh, I'll get him again. Throw the same shot again. Landed, same reaction. For it again, three times in a space of 25, 30 seconds. The same shot that I've knocked out people, you know, knocked my, my, my debut opponent out with, knocked my third opponent out with. And he's just looking back at me. I thought, okay, I might need to use another shot. And my coach from the outside shouts in, and he's use other shots. So I thought, oh, okay, I can't stop him. I can't knock him down. I can't hurt him. There's no point in me trying to overly do it. So. You know, started changing it up, using different shots. But it's a brilliant experience. Just being in there with someone with, of his experience, <clears throat> not just in the professional side, but the amateur side as well, and seeing the sort of... Because he's not taking it easy, um, regardless of weight, you know. He's not taking it easy because he's also training for his fight. So it's, it wouldn't be fair on him if I expected him to go 50% on me just because I'm a little bit lighter. Obviously, he he won't take the mick, you know, in trying to knock me out if he did hurt me. Um, but he's he's there to do his, you know, his prep, and I'm there to do a job in getting him ready for this fight. So um, it showed me that where I am now isn't too far away from, you know, my experience that I had as an amateur, you know, holds me in good stead. Because if I'm in with, you know, with Joe... And I'm giving it to him quite well as well. It shows that, you know, that, that my jump that would, would have to be made, you know, inshallah, when I get to that sort of level is not as big as some may expect. Some people coming out of the amateurs, they're, they're, 
it's such a big gap between you know where they are to even British level, um, and some people just find that too hard to, to 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 close the gap. And when they eventually get to British level, they get they get hurt and they get stopped and they get you know they lose to these people who you know have been Olympians or have that international experience. And that's something that I believe holds me in good stead that I have been about the block in a, you know, in essence, of amateur boxing. Because when I'm in with him, and getting this experience is another thing that adds to, you know, my knowledge of the game, you know, the, the, the way I go about handling it. And it's all about changing it up in the ring with him. And, you know, the stuff that he does is, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And him stopping Dubois, people don't realise how much power he's got. You know, he throws probably about 70% of his power in each shot, 60 and 70, because he throws so many, and it's just so awkward to deal with. <laughs> I, I mean, the, I watched the Daniel Dubois fight, actually, and, and it was a very highly anticipated, because they were both, like, on the fringe, weren't they? Um, and he just, like you said, it, was, it wasn't really one shot, it was just several hard shots over many rounds, and Dubois' the eye just... Acc- kind accumulation, of, yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, well, Anise, when we think about boxers, we always think about Rocky IV and those amazing training scenes. And, stuff. and everybody acknowledges that boxing has one of the hardest training um, kind of systems. Talk me through a typical, because now you're a professional, uh, talk me through a typical day and tell us how that compares to your amateur. Like, how, what would be, I know you've just mentioned you've got Joe Joyce sparring tonight, which sounds like it's going to be a tough one anyway. But um, talk me through a typical day for a professional boxer and then maybe compare that with how it was as an amateur. All right, so I'll start with as an amateur. So as an amateur, um, originally starting out, it was three times a week at my boxing club, um, two hours a day, and then, you know, two to three times running a week. Uh, and it would be two to three miles, depending on, you know, what the prep was. When I reached up to international level, um, uh, national, international level, uh, fighting three three-minute rounds and, you know, got a little bit faster paced, then it would be, you know, three times a week training again, occasionally four times a week if I, if there was sparring on a Friday that I might do. Um, and then three times, the other three days a week would be running. So unless I was, um, if I had sparring, I would be training the whole week. So in a fortnight, I'd say I had one day off. But that day would be a day of doing absolutely nothing. But along with that training, you do your... your um, yeah. sort of like your your repair recovery sessions you know uh, cold baths you know that's sort all of like the ice baths you know to prevent your delayed onset muscle soreness and um, to help recover quicker as well as you know your I used to be on protein quite a lot so a lot of protein shakes and stuff like that to help recover the body um, whereas as a pro the difference is that you're not just training once in a day. As an amateur, it'd be you do your training session tonight and then tomorrow night I'd do my running. I wouldn't be training. Friday I'd be training, Saturday I'd be running. Whereas as a pro, you train five days a week, twice. So Monday it would be, you know, boxing for two and a half hours and you go on a five kilometer run for example it depends on what my my strength and conditioning coach and my boxing coach have uh set me up so depending on where i am coming fight time um then on a tuesday i would do boxing as well as my strength and conditioning sessions so i wouldn't go running that night because i've done my strength and conditioning which incorporates sprints and uh that and, and whatever my coach has, has put out accordingly uh, on a Wednesday again it would be two sessions the running and the boxing a Thursday may only be one session depending on what again has been set up Friday two sessions strength and conditioning and boxing and then on a Saturday depending on what the coaches have said Saturday would be a run sometimes it's a 10 kilometer run sometimes just a 5 kilometer run so it all goes on what what they want and then my Sunday would be a recovery day but along with that you need to do um, the recovery is key and it's paramount I had about space of a year and a half of not using creatine any protein shakes anything like that because the creatine um, kills uh, it's like a, a byproduct of it is your DHT which kills hair hair follicles so I started losing losing a bit of hair so um, I stopped using it I thought you know I'm gonna go off all this rubbish 
and there's issues with over overusing it can lead to kidney stones and issues with, with personal health. So I thought I'm going to not use it. I'm going to go on traditional milk, you know, old school ways of of, of doing it. Um, but with that, you know, I didn't see too much of a difference in what my my recovery. It, it was similar. Uh, recently, I've gone back onto a, a cleaner protein, which is just, uh, in essence, uh, whey protein isolate. Um, no creatine, no extra rubbish that you don't need. Um, hydration tablets, because obviously when you're sweating so much, you need to hydrate yourself. Um, the the old-fashioned way of doing it, which my uh, my dad's elder brother it was an ex-army, um, uh, he was an ex-soldier, uh, paratrooper he was, so he, we would talk about, you know, when you when you would cramp, you know, about how he used to, they would, in the army, they would lace the water with salt to help. Obviously, when you're cramping, your body's lost a lot of salt. Um, so I would do the same. And then my strength and conditioning coach informed me about these hydration tablets, which essentially do the same job, but it just tastes a little bit nicer. So I was like, you know what, all right, fair enough, we'll go down that. So along with that, you know, using the um, the percussive uh, massages, so, you know, recovering, help, you know, massaging out any issues, any tightness, you know, the, the, the cold baths, the hot baths to help promote the recovery at the end of the hard week. You know, you'd have the, the, the hot bath, then that would be your recovery. You know, sort of, it's all it's all mixing it in, as well as having the balanced diet where you're ensuring that you're getting enough protein in for each day. Because it's about, I think it's about um, one and a half grams of protein per kilogram that you need to in, you, or intake. So for myself, it's about 160 grams a day, I think, if I, if I work it. That's just working out at the top of my head. It's roughly about 160 that I need to be taking. So, you know, you need to make sure that you're eating clean but and eating enough protein to ensure that you're not, um, you know, going backwards. You're not eating into your muscles. Sort of like when, when you're trying to lose weight, you look for a calorie deficit. You don't want to, you never want a protein deficit because then you start eating at your own muscles and losing the gains that you're making. So, uh, and what, what's your kind of so obviously you get pro, what, what would like what do you have for breakfast and lunch and dinner? I mean, I imagine you're not like the average Joe with junk food and like abs likes his snicker with Mars bars in the office and stuff. I'm, I'm assuming you're not, you're not up to those kind of tricks like your cousin. When you're exposing uh, me, you know, man. <laughs> Uh, no, um, so so like there'll be like average breakfast would be three or four wheat a bit, some eggs and a cup of tea. So that would be my little bit of sugar in the tea, a little bit of sugar in the wheat a bit, and that's it. Lunch would be tuna, possibly sandwiches or um, what's it called, like tuna pasta. China because tuna's got a lot of protein in it, so it'd be doing that, and as well as that, having uh, additional sort of like protein snacks. So, like your protein flapjacks, stuff like that to help build up. Uh, maybe a snack after training, which would be a protein shake. Um, more often than not, it would be a protein shake. But with my protein shake, I don't like mixing them with water. I do it with milk because then you get added bit that tastes a lot nicer. And you get that extra bit of protein from the milk, uh, the natural um, cow's milk that is. Um, not like back home where it would be a bit of buffalo milk. Can't wait to take take my protein shakes out uh, out there. But um, then dinner, it would be dinner. I'm a bit old school. I go a bit more for the uh, the obviously being in an Asian household. You know, we've got the the chapatis, the curry. Um, but mainly, what I would have is meat as well as a bit of veg. So it would depend on wh- whatever's made. More often than not, it would be some chicken with some veg, or you know. Uh, mutton with veg depending on whatever has been made sometimes veg on its own but I don't feel uh, normally I don't feel like I've gained much out of that so I normally have if it's just veg for example if it's like cauliflower gobby as we call it um, you know I, I'd add something else onto it to, to add add that little bit of substance to my food yeah, that sounds that sounds interesting. So you've got a good varied diet, uh, but do do you like ever like binge on junk anyway? When you think you know what, I've got a day off today, or uh, have Not you got really. that mindset which is I want to, I you know, I, you see there, there are there are times where you need a bit of sugar. So there might be a time where, and it's you know all athletes know it. You know you get you get you 
even without having like diabetes and whatnot, you know, you have when your sugar goes low and like you see the shaking. But it's like an athlete will know when they start feeling lethargic, start feeling, I feel a little bit dodgy. Then you know, you I'll, I'll have a you know a biscuit or two or you know a, a, one of those little um, Twix, the, the mini Twix things. So it's like I'd have that, but it's not like I'd, I'd never binge. You know, maybe a donut once in a while. You know, a Krispy Kreme. I don't know, a Krispy Kreme once in a while. You know, maybe a sugar ring donut. Even though we're cousins, I guess you're completely different to me. Then <laughs> it sounds like to me that you might not be related. Actually, it might be. Uh... <laughs> we, might to, we might have to get this checked. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, uh, it's it's just that even when I'm I'm away from boxing, I I try not to do it to overdo it because where you I've not had it for so long. I'm not someone who starts getting a craving that I need to... Uh, I've not had... A, a, at one point, there was about three months went by without having any piece of chocolate or any piece of, you know, confectionery. I'm not someone who's like, oh, I've not had it for three months. Let me go and have five of them right now. It's, it's like, if I need it, if I feel like I need it, I'll have a bit. If not, I can go, I can go without, unlike Abs. <laughs> oh, no, Abs is having a bit of a grilling here. I guess this is just an exposing session for me, isn't it? That's going to be the name of this podcast, Exposing uh, Abs. So, Anise, um, I was looking at your website. Obviously, we're going to um, put that in our links. Uh, Anise has got a nice website, a bit about who he is, his background. Uh, but you've got a My Story section, which um, I found really interesting because obviously you talk about cleft lip, cleft parlay. You've talked about some of the charity stuff you've done as well. Um, to me, it sounds like you going back 25 years has already started that ability to fight against things fight against the adversity um talk us through that i mean what happened and, and kind of how you've overcome those obstacles so early in your life okay well um yeah first of june 1996 i was born and i was born with a cleft lip and palate uh some people are born with just a cleft lip some people just born with the cleft palate it's rarer but happens um, I was born with, with both cleft lip and palate, and this was a unilateral cleft lip palate. So it went up one side into my nostrils, uh, into my nostril, and it was quite severe. Where between my nostril and my, my where my lip is now, there was there was nothing. Um, and you know, my grandfather remembers that you know when I was born, you know I couldn't suckle. It, it, it struggled. You struggle having feeds because you, you've just not got the ability, um, and. I had an operation, I mean, I was a week old and I had my first operation where they uh, were con connecting the lip up and sort of had a makeshift lip trying to connect what was uh, what was not there, the, where the muscle had split. Um, and that was the only operation I had until I was, uh, it was 2005 where I had a bone graft, um, which was to cover the cleft palate. Uh, so I took, they took a shaving of my of my hip bone and uh, put it in my mouth and uh, sew, sewed it up. And from that, you know, it fused, all fused together to try and cover the lip. But, you know, where normal people have um, their, you know, dentist private or, you know, with, with, a, with, with a normal provider, I had all my orthodontics done by uh, the NHS. So because of the cleft, the cleft lip and palate, they had to monitor... Uh, the effects of, say, having fixed braces are all done by the NHS, uh, the NHS team here where uh, I am in Watford, um, their special maxillofacial uh, team. So, you know, monitoring the effect that the, the, um, the fixed braces at first, the retainers, you know, issues that, that may be caused by the cleft, lip, uh, the cleft palate uh, onto my orthodontics. So, uh, you know, my, my upper jaw is slightly different, you know, to my lower jaw. So because of the, the, cle the cleft palate, it's a little bit angled. So it's always, you know, people always are going to make fun of it. You know, some people have um, opinions on it. And, uh, you know, as I think, you know, they can go and... Uh, Oh uh, well, there's, there's not, I'm not going to be rude, and I'm not, I'm not of that sort. So you know, they can go and do certain things to themselves. So um, you know, to put it in the nicest way, but um, 
Yeah, so I had that, and then I had my third operation, which was the reconstruction of my lip uh, in 2011. So 2011, I was given the option to either have full facial reconstruction, uh, which would be a full, you know, full lip uh, reconstruction, so where they take it, cut it all out, and make it in effect as to what we know as to a normal looking lip. Um, but with that, it would mean uh, a year out of sport because the healing time, um, the possibility of rupturing the um, what, what they would made um, was could happen um, due to the you know the severity of the operation. But the other one that they offered me was to uh, they cut inside the lip um, and pull the muscles together and sort of try and fuse. Um, the lip closer to make it look a little bit more as to what we know again normal um, uh, but this would be like you know, I'd only be off the s they originally I was under the impression it was six months but they said it was six weeks but I stayed away from sport for uh, about four and a half months um, just to make sure I didn't want it happening and then going through uh, going through all of the whole process again just because you know, I couldn't wait to get back into sport um, I opted for that the, the, the full reconstruction, they said that there will be scar tissue left on the outside, it will be visible, um, you know, if you grow a beard, you know, you might not grow the hair in that area because of the scars, and I thought the best option for me, being sports, you know, being just started at the time I started playing American football, and I was quite heavy on, you know, being the possibility of playing American football, doing the SATs, and potentially going to America to play, uh, or as they call it, football, um, over there. So there was that that I took into, into consideration. I was thinking there's going to be, if I, if I have to be out for a year, I lose a year of time. Um, so I decided to go to, for the second option, which was the slightly more minor surgery. Um, and it went well for what I, what I wanted. It's, you know, it's, you're still slightly visible, but at the end of the day, I believe that's what makes me unique. Um, and as, you know, again, as you know, a lot of people say in Islam, you know, someone who's a little bit different, you know, it, it doesn't show, you know, it shows that they're slightly special. They're unique in their own way to God. You know, this person is special in, in, in their own way. Everyone's special in their own way, but, you know, it's just like a little bit more of a twist. So um, that's what it is. I've had, I've had, you know, over the years, I've had people, you know, trying to ridicule me for my, my cleft lip, cleft palate, you know, certain pronunciation when I was when I was younger and I had the still had the palate. So there was, you know, I worked with the speech therapist people to try and uh, ensure that my pronunciation was uh, proper, uh, to put it in the easiest way. Um, you know, I've always had people wanting to ridicule me. You know, in the same try in in essence try and you know be bullies really. Um, but it's, I've always stood up for myself. Uh, I'm not someone who shies away from confrontation, as bad as it might sound. Uh, you know, if, if someone's going to try and confront me about an issue that, you know, is nothing that I can control, I can't control how I was made. You know, only God controls that. And if God's made me look like this, you know, who am I to change it in effect? You know, and that was another re another thing about, you know, the, I thinking back to it, if I've got the full facial reconstruction, how would I feel? I've lost my sense of you, you know, uniqueness, in essence. Um, See, so yeah, I've I've been I've been a fighter since you know since I was a, I was a child fighting against through the adversity of having the cleft lip and palate, uh, and the, going through the operations and you know the hospital stays. As a kid, you don't really want to be in hospital. You know, you, you know you want to be out with your friends. You don't want to be stuck inside. Uh, you know, where I was in the hospital when I was uh, 2005, you know, stuck inside a hospital for a week and a half. And then when I got out, I had to stay at home for two weeks um, before I could go back to school. And even then, I couldn't do sport um, for a third, I think it was four and a half, five months on top of that because of the bone graft, uh, you know, and then, or contact sport. So, you know, I had to um, move with what I could do. You know, joining the uh, junior school netball team just because I needed some form of uh, some form of sport. I was the only guy in the team, but um, you know you got to do what you got to do, as they say.
Yeah, that's really insightful. I mean, and it's interesting to see that, you know, the journey that you've gone through and you're still here today. And actually, of all the things you could be doing, you're a professional boxer, you know, which tells you uh, that you've you've literally pushed, knocked that fence right down, pushed through that barrier. Um, I think Ab's just, got a, Ab's just got his hand up, so I'm going to... I know, I was just moving my hand from the face, but... Um... Obviously, I mean, that is a very shocking story. Obviously, you've been in and out of hospital and it's not normal for, obviously, a child to be like that, like you said. But like Rika said, look at you now. You know, you went through all them struggles, but you overcame every single one of them. And you also mentioned to us before you've been training with Anthony Joshua uh, at his gym in Finchley. And so I just wanted to touch up on that before. Obviously, we've got to go to uh, Dr. Moe's, but he's been quiet all this podcast. So we've got to give him some uh, some time to talk as well. And then we'll probably wrap it up after that. But just uh, quickly, you want to touch on your training with Anthony Joshua, your encounters with him and what it's like to be in the presence of somebody of that stature. You know, uh, uh, probably one of the best heavyweight boxers of our generation at this time. You know, uh, what's it like to be training with him? What's it like to just be in his presence? See, where we're saying be in his presence as if he's someone, you know, of outworldly presence in that. So I, I sort of reject that view to say as if he's any different from anyone else. I'm sorry to put you down, cousin, but, um, you know, it's not like it's any different. Um, he's... I, we're both from Watford, so I knew I knew of him before I actually turned pro and before he, um, you know, shot up to world level because I trained out of, I used to spar out of Finchley on the regular because of my um, amateur mentor, John Murphy. His son runs, uh, was a head coach at, at Finchley Boxing Club. So whenever we were unable to have sparring, you know, there was no one rarely any people at my weight at my gym so he would always have and they're known for having their big lads so i'd go down and spa there so i'd I'd been seen him around before um he knew my father because he um he used to get his hair cut and hang around where in one of our shops one of the the barber shop that my father runs um and my father would see him on the regular stuff like that so that they knew each other um like that he knew me through there as well um and he had a number of friends that he you know he still hangs out with nowadays actually um and they knew me um through their younger brothers so you know it, it was all on i knew him knew, like a friend of a friend for example but training you know training alongside him because I, I used to train with his amateur coaches sean and gary sean murphy and gary foley um and training with them whilst he was around is it, it, it's it was interesting to see the, the shape that he, like the training, like the, the way that his training takes shape. So what he does, what might be different to what I'm doing, because because of the level he was at, you know, the the sort of the way in which he was training was a little bit different, a little bit that they had their slightly different training methods um, because of his coaches doing things a little bit different. Like I was there for when. They, they undertook most of the training for the Andy Andy Ruiz Jr. rematch. So I saw, you know, his journey. You know, I knew he could box before, uh, but I've seen the journey of him turning into, a, you know, more of a fledged boxer than a, you know, just a powerhouse, just walking people down, you know, and I've seen it on pads before. I've seen him training where he's boxing, not actually just trying to walk in and destroy everything. And then just having the ability to see this firsthand whilst I'm training at the same point, you know, he, he would give little hints of knowledge. Um, so I, I'd be I'd be in the ring doing doing something. He'd, he'd throw out, you know, have you tried this? Why don't you try this? Showing a few things that he might have picked up, you know, myself giving slight suggestions where I might not feel like, you know, where, where I don't feel like I'm, I'm overstepping my mark because... His, I don't want to feel like I'm intruding on his coaches and him, but just saying, look, you know, have you, have you thought about this or this? Will that work? And sort of like questioning their minds, sort of like picking at their brains. Because you, you again, like I said earlier with, with boxers, is you're never just yourself. You know, every boxer has picked something up from someone else. And it, it's the same with coaches. No coach has the same teaching style. 
then some may have similar styles, but someone teaches something in a different way than someone else might. And you, you know, picking people's brains who are, you know, of that experience is, is brilliant. And it was nice just, you know, being in in the gym. You know, the experience. You know, the the laughs, the jokes. You know, the the uh, the yeah, just there. Yeah, the the hot, the overall experience. No, it was, it was it was good and it was enjoyable. But when COVID happened and then. Um, my coaches had said, look, they were unable to retrain me and linked up with my new coach. I feel like, you know, again, if it wasn't meant to be, it wouldn't have happened. You know, God has a plan. So I had to take it in my stride. You know, I enjoyed that year that I was down at Finchley. But now, you know, I'm at uh, jab boxing uh, with my coach, Josh, Josh Burnham. And if anything happens, you know, I, I feel like I'll be there for the rest of my career. You know, hopefully, God willing, nothing happens, which means it won't. I'm enjoying myself where I am. I've got a good team around me. My coach, my main head coach, Josh, and, you know, his team is, is perfect and is, is what, what you want, really. I mean, um, you kind of shut me down. Let me just uh, explain what I meant by being in his presence was just by being with him. What's it like being with him? <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> before anybody else shuts me down on that, <laughs> I think, like I said, this podcast has been... Um, uh, exposing me all that time, <laughs> but um, it was it was it was it was good it was good to be in his presence. You know, he's 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 a, he's a very laughy character. Um, he enjoys his music. He, he likes rapping. You know, he, he's from that you know background where he, he's he's rapped for many years. I've, I've known people that have been around him as well, and he's, he, it's not just like something that's happened now. He's always enjoyed, you know, as as you say, spitting a few bars. He, he enjoys, you know, flow. He, he listens to the classics, which is another thing that we that we you know we've done. We'd be training and playing a bit of Biggie Smalls, rapping along to the songs, you know. And it's just you know just certain things like that you, you don't you don't do all the time, you know. And not everyone would do that as well. That's the other thing. Exactly, and I mean, I guess having a good relationship with the people that you train with is key in the gym. Yeah. And um, so. I guess right now what we'll do is we'll move on. I think obviously uh, Dr. Mo wants his part in the in the podcast as well. He's got a few questions to ask. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Mo, over to you. So Abs, you probably don't. You're probably too young to know who Biggie Smalls is, unless you've watched Netflix documentaries. <laughs> I know who Biggie Smalls okay. is. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, so and he's a couple of minutes left. We'll do some quick fire friendly questions. I guess make it a bit light hearted. These two have been up all night creating notes and creating some of the serious questions. But let's move on to some light hearted quick fire questions. Um, Muhammad Ali's fight with Sonny Liston, Phantom Punch. Did it connect or not connect? Your opinion. Connected. Okay. Great. The Muhammad Ali. Do you join anymore, or is it just is this, is this how we do it? No, no, yeah? go on. If you want to add a little bit to that, that'd be good. Yeah, no. Um, it, it, what, watching it, um, it landed. Um, it was a great punch. It was sort of like your overhand uh, right comes down. The, the, the thing that people, some people don't see about the, see about that shot is Liston was going into it. So it's a bit like um, my recent knockout, uh, where you throw the punch, and if the person's going down, it's, it's that thing, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, gravity. So the gravity pulls the punch down. So the force of a punch coming down is is a lot stronger than the force of a punch going up. So where it's come down, it, it's affected him. I, I I think it landed. So <laughs> okay, second question: um, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, should he have thrown that last punch? No. He he, he, he saved he saved he saved Foreman's life. Again, it's that thing: a punch uh, flight going down. So a punch, landing a punch when you're throwing it downwards, uh, there's more momentum on the punch, there's more, uh, you know, velocity on the punch because it's, it's going with gravity and formal was going down as well. So if he'd thrown that, it could have meant, you know, a worse effect for Foreman from that fight. Whereas Foreman, you know, after that, he had a few more fights, then he retired, then he went back and, you know, won uh, the world title as an older, slightly larger gentleman. But um, would that have happened if Ali had landed that, that, that extra punch? At the, end, at the end of the day, we've got to remember that it's, it's a sport. We are there to hurt each other, but I think that we're not there to kill each other. It is, a, it is a sport where it is licensed to kill. If someone dies in the ring, it's, you, you can't be held uh, criminally responsible. But at the end of the day, you need to remember that 
that's you, we, we, we also have a duty of care to our opponent that if he's already going down, you know, do we need to, to give send him that final blow? Yeah, fair enough. Some good points there. And then what are your top tips for do- um, boxers coming through the ranks on how to lose weight but maintain power? Uh, the, best, the best bit would be running is a key. Running is key. Um, that helps you lose weight and it also turns your body up. So you, I, I found a lot, a lot more from um, running that you know your, your body will tone itself up uh, when you're hitting the heavy bag that also helps tone your body up strengthen your body and i would say try and shy away from doing weights like a bodybuilder um, that's you're, you're not there some people might think you know the new the new era of boxing is to be looking like a bodybuilder ripped up you know big muscles six pack i'm built a bit like an older old school fighter where might not look physically pleasing to you know or aesthetically pleasing to others to the you know men or women alike i might not look might not be a poster boy but i'm not there to look good i'm there to box good and that's my advice to whenever i'm I'm down at my amateur club helping them out it's not you don't need a six pack as long as i could take a punch and sometimes when you have a six pack you're actually exposing your ribs and your um your uh, what's what they call the the inner muscles alongside your ribs the intercostal muscles and intercostal that's it yeah 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 so you're exposing them whereas that slight layer of fat that you have over helps actually protect and that's what a lot of people don't realize actually having a little layer even if it's slight i'm not saying be walk around like andy ruiz with a big gut but having that slight layer actually protects protects you as well as you know supports you so Abs, you might want to take down all those Hulk Hogan posters in your bedroom, if that's all right. And then the last question, Lisa, is obviously we've got a lot of doctors listening to this podcast. Uh, any messages to them? Anything you want to shout out to them before we kind of wrap up? Especially in this in this current climate, you know, I just want to say thank you to everyone for all the hard work they've done over 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 the coronavirus, especially you know even before it's. I I understand the role and you know being a doctor is very time consuming and it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure on it because if if you do something slightly wrong you know it, it can it can be you know it could it can end up so badly for someone so it's like the, the pressure the time you know the time that we're in at the moment especially you know the pressure that there is on doctors you know to help everyone to help you know and, and try and stay safe themselves whilst also trying to protect everyone from the coronavirus i just want to say keep up the good work to everyone keep smashing it to put it in you know a colloquial way keep smashing it keep doing what you're doing and you know just keep striving for greatness because that's where we know we'll never let ourselves fall behind or fall off or you know lack certain areas is where we strive for greatness because we strive to be better than we were the day before. Perfect. So, Abs, over to you if you want to start bringing this to a close. Yeah, so uh, obviously it's been quite an interesting podcast. Uh, Thank you very much, Anise, for all the advice and all the tips that you gave and obviously for, um, you know, thanking the doctors for what they do. And obviously as Mo and Vikas are both doctors as well, so they've had their hand in saving lives as well. And uh, thank you for that as well. And, yeah, so we hope you're the best in your career. And, you know, hopefully we see you like you want to be one of the greatest boxers. You want to be known as one of the best boxers that's ever lived. And uh, hopefully we see you at that rank. I mean, the way you're going now, there's no reason why you shouldn't be there. And, uh, yeah, so uh, Anis Taj, if you want to go follow him on Instagram, it's at Anis Taj Officials. Uh, We will be shouting it out on our own Instagram as well. Uh, that's it, inspire underscore medics and um all you know all his social media links will be on there as well so facebook twitter and thank you very much guys for listening and thank you very much mo and vikas and anis taj for coming and uh, thank you very much have a nice day yeah brilliant thank you very much anis so obviously yeah we you know we've it's been a pleasure speaking to you really so your journey um has got lots of really inspirational points and you're really young you're only 25 you know you've told us about the cleft lip you told us about you know uh, some of the struggles that you've had in your life how you overcame them you've got a law degree you know so you've been to university you've overcome the ups and downs 
amateur level, you know, you've gone in represented internationally, ABA elite champion, and now you've got your professional career, 3-0. and So, um, you know, we're all excited, really, to see which direction you take it in. Uh, I don't really use Instagram that much, but I have got my account, and I am going to be following an East Hodge official, and I will uh, tell all my friends... Okay. I've, We've got a lot of boxing fans that I know, so I'm going to definitely give you a shout out. And I'm looking forward to see seeing your journey because August the seventh, we're going to definitely keep an eye on that. Um, and like I said, I think lots of the doctors and the audience from th- this podcast can actually learn a lot from you, which is kind of why we brought you on. Uh, we knew you had a good story to tell. You've overcome all the obstacles. You've proven that. I think the most important thing from this podcast is you've proven that if you put if you've got a strong mindset. If you work hard, you know, if you've got a good uh, commitment, dedication and faith as well, if you bring that together, you can end up being successful, whether you're a boxer, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you know, a nurse or whatever it is that you want to go and do. So uh, for me, it's a massive thank you. I mean, I know Abs was going to have the last word, but I thought I've got to just give you, you know, because I think I've actually really enjoyed it. I've been listening to you carefully. Um, over this little round podcast thing that's blocking my thing. So but I've just been listening carefully and I, I found it very inspirational. And I think uh, you should be very proud of yourself and show, so should your family for a 25-year-old to have done that much. And this is just the start, right? So this is why I'm excited because I, I just want to see, uh, obviously, thoughts and prayers from us as well are with you as well. Um, and I've got lots of boxing fans in my family. I've got lots of friends, even uh, people that you know I've studied and done stuff with and they're all big fight fans so uh, they're definitely going to be on looking out for Anis Taj. Thank you to, to you know all of you guys having me on you know for when Abs made the, the original you know suggestion I was like you know what as 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 a good uh, inspirational mind Easy E once said all publicity is good publicity so you know it's not something that I might have envisioned a few months ago you know IFL TV boxing related everything you know inspire medic oh, I'm not a medic but at the same point the history that I've got you know it, it, it is it is worth talking about and I just want to say you know thank you guys for having me on and it's been a pleasure you're most welcome and uh, Rikas also touched on your family being proud of your cousin so uh, I know from this side we're all proud of you you've done good and we're all rooting for you and we're all praying for you so uh, yeah thank you very much and you're welcome and uh, likewise, and it's, it's uh, similar to what Vikas and um, Abza said. I like the fact that you're quite humble and you're you're down to earth, especially at 25. I remember when I was 25, straight out of medical school? Well, yes, now. And, and I guess that'd be nice to see you continue that kind of level headedness as you go through your career and get bigger and bigger, no doubt. So, big thank you from my medics, from all the doctors that are on our platform. I'm sure they'll be messaging you once they see this podcast. Thank you. Well, if I wasn't humble, my granddad would notice slapping a few times. So. 